Welcome back to another episode of Divorce at Altitude. I am Ryan Kalamea. Uh, this week, I am joined with uh, my co-host, Amy Gosha. We're going to talk about gray divorces uh, and the particularities that arise from that. But first of all, Amy, uh, how uh, how goes it? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm good. I'm good. Well, uh, we are both very far away from, uh, I hope, um, gray yeah. hairs. But, uh, you know, gray divorces, they have become increasingly popular. I think the statistics um, are, 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 you know, pretty interesting in terms of the increase of divorces uh, for people 50 years of age older. And, you know, there's some different uh, theories on why that is. Uh, you know, one theory is certainly that people are living longer and that, you know, they are looking at their their marriage and they are unhappy and they, um, you know, don't want to uh, continue that um, for the next 20 or 30 years um, and a whole host of, of other reasons. But Amy, um, any uh, insight from your perspective on gray divorces? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, we have the baby boomer generation, so there's more of them in that I guess, age range. Um, also, I think looking at a second or third marriage, just in general, the statistic is higher for divorce rates. So that could, you know, I think all of those things probably, um, you know, accumulate to the reasons, but I think those are, you know, some of the driving factors. Right. And, you know, I mean, women are becoming more financially uh, independent. Um, and, you know, the uh, male with, you know, we see all these Viagra commercials, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, and, and uh, the kind of stereotypical, like older guy with the younger girl. I mean, there's, there's all these different, um, you know, uh, feelings and, and stories behind them. But let's kind of dive in and, and talk about the issues that, uh, from a legal perspective, really can, can be different or unique to a great divorce. And the first thing um, is, uh, you know, normally we talk about property and then we get into maintenance, but let's talk about maintenance first and income after uh, a divorce and, and retirement. So, Amy, talk to me about um, those uh, income and, and maintenance issues. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're, you know, retirement age and or you have retired, I mean, your income could be um, a lot less and, you know, unless you have like passive income, um, you know, but the court is going to, you know, look at you know, what is your circumstance? Like if you've hit full retirement age, you know, there might not be, you might not be able to pay spousal maintenance. Um, even if you have a lot of property, there might just be property, you know, to divide, um, you know, but I think that people accumulate their wealth. If it's like a 40 year marriage, um, you know, they're planning it in a certain way. And one party might have the majority of the retirement um, or might have worked, you know, the, the majority of the time during the marriage or might have, you know, a business and, you know, they've done some family succession planning. So it just gets kind of, you know, complicated, um, you know, and I think most people at that age, it might be kind of the last thing that they're thinking about, um, you know, to divide their assets. So, you know, when you're looking at this, I guess, age range in divorce, what's unique is, they might not have as much income. So there might not be, you know, really as many maintenance awards, um, you know? And I think if you're the spouse that hasn't earned the money, like you might be thinking, well, I did all of this, you know, to acquire our wealth, like I need, you know, maintenance. But if the other party is not making money, I mean, they can't afford maintenance. So that's one of the first things I think about. What about you? What are some of the concerns or, topics you see? So I think there's two things, Amy, that come to mind for me. One is that baby boomers and, and gray divorces, they, they fought, they, they're more of a traditional that the man works, the woman, um, you know, stayed at home. And so you get into that stereotype a, a little bit more frequently. And oftentimes you will be dealing with um, a, a man who is, you know, working, um, or there's a primary breadwinner, um, you know, going back to our Eric Wolf uh, scenario, Eric and Melanie Wolf, our hypothetical divorce couple back in, in episode uh, one, if you fast forward that to, you know, 30, 40 years, Eric might be nearing retirement, 
And that brings up, you know, these chains that might be the reason why they're looking at getting a divorce. But, uh, you know, that he might be earning income, but he's just about to get um, or just about, you know, of retirement age. So do you have maintenance, spousal support, alimony, um, you know, now? And then when does it terminate? And, you know, self-employed individuals, they generally work longer, um, you know, into their 70s, um, as opposed to more of a salaried where they hit 67 and or, or 66. And, you know, they work for, uh, you know, they, and they have a pension, which we'll talk about later. They might kind of hit a, a particular age that really is, uh, you know, is going to determine that they that they retire. But, you know, there's been some changes in the law. Um, you know, the, the law now contemplates for maintenance that if there's a termination or a change um, that, you know, the law now contemplates that if a party has reached a reasonable um, or full retirement age, then they, you know, there's a presumption that they're stopping work uh, and that it's made in good faith. And that that's going to be a little bit different than, you know, someone that is experiencing, you know, a really a severe case of divorce flu and all of a sudden they can't work and they can't you know earn income that the law kind of understands that um you know that that might be that that's a reasonable amount you know there's intermarriage a swing where you know this ups worker um he you know basically uh, or he, he was a long-range trucker and he was making really good money and i think he wanted to be closer to his family and he didn't want to be doing the long trips and he was getting older, so he switched to being a UPS driver. His income went down or some sort of local delivery, and the court was presented in that case. Was that a reasonable change? And so it's those sorts of issues that you, um, you know, are dealing with in a, in a gray divorce. The second thing that I'll, um, you know, address, and, and this kind of leads into retirement and, and, and uh, Social Security, which we'll talk about, is that you know, parties, they can go through uh, their life and their work planning for retirement and they're, you know, generating savings um, and then they're banking on a particular kind of uh, income based on those savings. And that can change when you have a divorce. And it is something that, you know, parties went into retirement um, thinking that they would have one large nest egg that was combined. Now, all of a sudden they're looking at um, splitting that. So, Amy, you know, tell us, uh, tell our audience about what considerations you uh, see with that in gray divorces. So, some of the issues, Ryan, that you know we see is, um, you know, if someone has you, you were talking about kind of that traditional kind of family unit where the man is, you know, the earner and the wife maybe was the homemaker and raised the kids, and she hasn't worked in a long time. So, when I have a client who, you know, she's in her late 50s or early 60s, um, she's, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, she may not, she's not going to be able to probably get back into the workforce, um, you know, very easily. And so from the earner's perspective, the husband's perspective, you know, he's going to say, well, you know, she should be at least making, you know, minimum wage 40 hours per week. Um, but when you split households, you know, as we know, in any divorce, it's just you know, more expensive. Um, so your expenses go up, um, you know, parties might be living in a house where they're going to retire and it's more expensive. Um, like they both might not be able to afford it, you know, living on their own. So I've had situations where, you know, if they're not really high net worth individuals, but, you know, kind of doing fairly well, they might have to sell their house. Um, and in this kind of a market, you know, you might get top dollar for your house, but where are you going to go? You know, you're going to have to downsize. And a lot of people, you know, that's kind of depressing to them because they're like, we've worked our, our entire life, you know, to do X and then the, you know, the, their life changes. Um, and I think another consideration, you know, that I look at is social, social security benefits and divorce. The court can't in Colorado divide social security benefits. You know, however, if you've been married at least for 10 years, um, a, a period of 10 years, and you're not the earner, you can also draw on possibly the earner's um, social security benefits as long as you're 62 years of age and you haven't remarried. Um, the caveat with that, though, is that if you do get remarried, those benefits, um, you know, would stop. But 
you know, that is something, um, you know, that we look at, which I think dovetails into kind of some of those re other retirement issues. What are some other issues, um, Ryan, that you've seen in your um, divorces related to retirement? Well, now we're, we're you know, in, in an age where defined benefit, um, pension plans, those sorts of of retirement plans are fairly um, they're, they're uncommon, but for baby boomers, it was a lot more common. And so when you're dividing um, a pension and we're you know now getting into the the aspect of dividing property. And so, you know, people need to understand when you are dividing property, specifically with a gray divorce, uh, you're often talking about retirement benefits. And that can be in a 401k, an IRA. Um, and there's different kinds of IRAs and a defined benefit. So when I, um, you know, def when I reference a defined benefit, that is, it's a pension and it's a guaranteed payment, um, you know, where defined or the para, um, the, the, which is the uh, public um, pension plan for uh, Colorado employees. So teachers, uh, judges, uh, other, um, you know, public employees, there are a couple different options that you can um, have when you are addressing that. Um, so, you know, if there's a particular amount of payment, you can say that that payment is is split in a particular manner. And it often depends and you can go back in um, and look at the history. So uh, especially with the defined benefit plan, um, you know, there could have been service when the person was in their 20s before the marriage. And oftentimes those pension um, you know, they'll, they'll have a record of that. So there could be some separate property component. But if, you know, there's a, a monthly payment, it's a guaranteed amount, you could, you know, split it and ask the pension. And, and you know, most pensions will have um, information, you know, for example, Colorado for Para, there's a whole website, you know, explaining about what happens with divorce. And there's, you know, option one, option two, option three. And it, and it really depends because you can have it where Para or a defined, you know, uh, pension, you know, defined benefit, you tell the company to just split it. Um, you know, those those are taxable uh, earnings. And so that's something to, to take in mind because depending on the pension or depending on the, the retirement plan, the income generated can be uh, taxable. So it's, it's helpful to have those um, issues addressed. A lot of, you know, questions that we get, Amy, as you know, is, you know, is dividing property a taxable event? And, you know, you have to kind of wade through that. But when you're dealing with with pension plans, um, you know, there's there's a couple of different um, options. And it, it depends on if, you, you know, you can get a lower amount. Um, for example, in para, if the primary beneficiary uh, passes away and you can have, you know, the pension might just completely go away. Um, you know, because the pension was tied to that person's service and most of those defined benefit plans is based on, a, you know, a guaranteed payment for the life of that person. Um, and then, you know, you might want to protect the, the, the spouse who, uh, you know, is, is reliant on that, that income. Um, so, you know, life insurance is something that we'll get into. But Amy, with, with dividing a 401k or IRAs, what are the things that, um, you typically are are looking at when you're in a gray divorce and retirement funds, um, specifically with 401ks and IRAs are at issue? Um, well, first of all, you have to look at the tax issues. Like if you're, if you have a Roth IRA versus, you know, a traditional IRA, um, you know, you're, if you're the, you want to kind of split those not equally, but you know, they're, they're not worth the same amount. Um, whereas like with a 401k, you're going to need a qualified domestic relations order, um, you know, to do that. So I think when we're just dividing retirement, I try to do it where I try to avoid doing a for like a qualified domestic relations order if I can. Um, and if I see a Roth IRA, I'm going to want my client to have that Roth IRA. Um, so those are kind of, you know, some, some of the things that I look at. Um, what are some of the things, Ren, that you look at with retirement and, divide, and division of those types of assets? Yeah, I think people, they don't understand that, um, you know, a 401k and a traditional IRA, the money, let's say it's a million dollars, 
um, in one account, that is not the same as a million dollars of, of cash. Because when you take that distribution from that 401k or traditional IRA, it's going to be taxed. And, you know, so that we, we want to make sure that we're comparing apples to, to, to apples. And so oftentimes one party will have, you know, way more um, in, in the sense of 401k. They might have been the primary breadwinner and they because you, you can uh, oftentimes, um, you know, these retirement funds, they're restricted and they're based on income. So one party will throughout the marriage contribute to that retirement account. And then that kind of raises the issue of, you know, that we always hear in, in that initial consultation of, you know, they have this amount in their name um, and, you know, that uh, does title matter. Um, you know, it also kind of brings up, as I said before, with with pension plans, there's oftentimes a record of, you know, when um, the, the in terms of separate property. When we're dealing with separate property with 401ks or IRAs, you know, getting back to, uh, you know, the, the amount um, that that party had in that account during, you know, when they got married, that is, uh, you know, when you have rollovers, people switch jobs, it is really difficult. One thing that I have um, found is it's very difficult to prove uh, and trace that separate property. Um, and, you know, for people that don't understand separate, you know, property and tracing, you know, go back to the uh, episode that we did with Andy Baum, where he explains tracing separate property. But, you know, those retirement accounts, they both can be, you know, they, they should be looked at uh, differently um, than a house or, you know, uh, in some sort of bank account. But I will say that it, depending on what the kind of profile of those assets it can make a divorce, you know, easier. I mean, I dealt with a $20 million divorce that, you know, on its face, you'd be like, wow, $20 million. That is a lot of money. There's, they're going to fight over that. Um, it was pretty easy because we ended up just going to the financial advisor, telling him to kind of divide it. And there was really no issues on, you know, who, what the, what, what the thing, what, what the amount that it was worth. And we just told the financial advisor on a particular day to equally divide it. And, you know, that's what he ended up uh, doing. They both trusted him, but, you know, that also raises the issue of financial planning. So Amy, what, uh, when I mentioned financial planning and great divorces, uh, what am I talking about? And so I, you had a really key point. So when you're looking at dividing assets, a lot of times it is really good to take that to a financial planner to figure out how to divide that equally because there are tax consequences, even though when you, you know, transfer property incident to a divorce, it's not quote unquote taxed, but you know, like a dollar in a investment account is not the same dollar as in a retirement account. Um, and with financial planning, like going forward, um, you know, one thing that I do is I look, I, I take a budget to a financial planner with my client because I want them to know like, okay, depending on how long that they're going to live, like, here's how much they need, you know, so they really need to kind of plan for, you know, like essentially long-term, you know, planning for, um, you know, later in life. So I think that's really, you know, really important. Um, also, I think with the financial planning piece is just, um, you know, making sure that, Okay. Yeah. Ryan, what do you think? Um, when you get a financial planner involved, um, what do you usually um, advise your client? Well, I think it gets into uh, the the more traditional, again, the more kind of stereotypical role that if one party was the primary breadwinner, the other party, they might receive a substantial amount of money in a gray divorce, but they don't know what to do with it. And they have historically through the marriage not been you know, in charge of the finances, but now they are. And that can both be scary, it can be um, you know, invigorating for uh, you know, people that, are, that might be one of the reasons that they wanna go through a divorce is because they wanna be independent. But with that independence comes responsibility and you know, they have to educate themselves. So they're going to get into life insurance, uh, health insurance, long-term care, uh, those sorts of, of issues. So frequently the less sophisticated party 
uh, you know, we're referring those or making sure bringing them in. We're not financial advisors. No. We typically will look, I mean, we have a ton of experience with uh, seeing people's financial health. And, you know, I can tell someone, listen, like, you're going to have to go back to work or you're going to be, you know, fine. Um, but, you know, it's a matter of making sure that that person, because I, I want to see them in five to 10 years. And, you know, they have, they still have the, you know, money that, um, that we anticipate that, that they would. And that kind of relates to uh, budgeting. But I mentioned life insurance and long-term care. Uh, Amy, why are those issues relevant um, more in a gray divorce, uh, except for the obvious that people are older, but why are we having to navigate those issues in a, in a divorce? Yeah, so with life insurance, you know, if there is a maintenance obligation, you're going to want to secure that with life insurance. And that can be tricky because if, you know, they have, I guess, term policies in existence, they might be um, expiring. Um, it can be expensive depending on someone's health to be able to afford life insurance. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you look at not only securing your obligation for spousal maintenance, it's also, you know, planning for the future as well. Like if you need, you know, long-term care, you know, that's a real thing. It's really expensive. So that's something that, you know, needs to be planned for. Um, and I do think that, you know, when we're talking about, you know, division of property as well, I think it's important that, um, you know, you do look at the budget um, for someone and we're looking at, um, you know, it could be expensive to have those types of policies and that needs to be put into, you know, their budget and accounted for. Yeah. And I think it goes back to our earlier point in that people can have a plan that they're going to retire and they're anticipating that the other is going to take care of them if they they uh, need that. And that when you go through a divorce, all of a sudden you're confronting uh, again, it's it's the independence also you know has responsibility. And if you um, you know were originally planning on having someone take care of you, your spouse, and now you're looking at a great divorce, then you're you know, you're having to consider long term care as well as health insurance and you know making sure that those are issues that you're going to address because if one party is eligible for medicare um, and the other party is not they're younger then we're going to have to kind of figure that um that aspect out and you know having spousal continuing coverage um coverage through an employer if if someone's still employed um, but then the long-term care you know medicaid might they might be eligible um, you know, if if for long for long term care, but that long term care, um, those those coverages can be extremely expensive. I've had to, you know, uh, navigate that a little bit um, or just at least talk about it with my own parents um, because they're getting to that uh, to that age. And, you know, having a plan in place, uh, you know, that is especially important, especially when one party has not really thought of that, um, you know, because they traditionally were just not the the financial um, planner of, you know, that couple. Yeah. And I think it can be kind of summed up. And when you're dealing with a gray hair divorce, you're really looking at health, like physical health, financial health, and how is that, you know, how are you going to transition that? Um, and so I do think it is really important, you know, even when you're looking at um, a house, like if you're going to purchase a new house, you have to look at like, what are like, what are these expenses? And do I need to put that into the budget? Like, does the furnace need to be replaced? So you just think about, you know, some of those issues and how it ties to the budget to make sure that, you know, your client um, is going to be taken care of. Well, and you mentioned health um, and that raises uh, a topic that is something that we've definitely dealt with. And Amy, you in particular, because you, um, you know, went, went to the uh, Court of Appeals or uh, Supreme Court on the competency. But, you know, there's issues of, you know, it, it, divorce is really emotional. Um, it can, you know, drive uh, people who are otherwise um, kind of sane to kind of go temporarily a little bit, you know, in, in insane. And I don't, you know, mean that in a in a derogatory sense, but you know, competency can be a real issue in great divorce. So, um, tell our audience, like, how does what's the uh, kind of law as far as competency in in Colorado, and why does it come up? Um, or how, how can we address it in a gray divorce? 
Yeah, so in a grade of force, I mean, competency can be kind of challenging. You're dealing with, you know, people might have Alzheimer's or memory loss. Um, you want to make sure that they understand, you know, the agreements that they're entering. Um, and the law in Colorado kind of has been ever evolving. But in Colorado, we have guardian ad litems where um, they can serve as a, a fiduciary and can step in the shoes if someone, um, you know, does not have capacity to be able to reach agreements or to understand, you know, the um, what's going on in the legal proceedings. So essentially, you know, if a court um, is able to has is reasonably convinced that the party is not mentally competent um, to effectively participate, that's kind of the general like benchmark. Um, and you know, we look at in remarriage of Sorensen, um, which you know I was involved in on the remand in that case. But it essentially set forth that, um, you know, for a court to determine if someone has capacity and if a guardian ad litem should be essentially appointed, the court has to have a, a hearing on that to determine um, if, you know, a party, you know, is does have capacity to enter the agreements and to understand, you know, the financial and, you know, legal issues that are going on or if a GAL needs to be appointed as a guardian ad litem. Um, and so, you know, it just it, it definitely can complicate things um, if you do have a spouse who, um, you know, has, you know, those types of issues. But essentially, the you know solution to that is that a guardian ad litem can be, you know, appointed to, you know, serve as a fiduciary representative in, in that type of regard. Amy, it raises the topic of adult children because oftentimes uh, we will uh, be dealing with adult children and they might be appointed, at, you know, at, at not necessarily as a guardian ad litem, but as a personal representative. But, um, you know, going back to the competency, great divorces can take longer because both, you know, there's some emotional issues. Um, the, the kind of grieving process for their marriage, especially if it's a, you know, 30, 40 year marriage, um, you know, that it, it is, uh, it can be really a long process when you're talking about grieving and, you know, but it also can take longer because, you know, a party may not understand and they might have to have um, the issues explained to them several times. But in terms of adult children, um, how are adult children, what are the concerns and, and issues that we have to navigate um, as divorce lawyers with a gray divorce? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, when you think about gray hair divorce, you can, it's easy to forget that there are adult children involved. Um, you know, if we have adult children in their 20s and 30s, it's, it still is difficult probably for them to process their you know, parents divorce. And I think, you know, children who are, or adult children who are 20 and 30, they're also looking at their future, um, you know, and what does this mean to them as far as, you know, inheritance, um, you know, not that people should live their life just based off of the parent, you know, their parents' inheritance, you know, but it is a concern for them. Um, so it, it can be complicated because maybe the adult children are married and maybe there's grandchildren involved. So you have this kind of multi-generational, um, you know, you mentioned the grieving process. I think it just would trickle down, you know, not only to adult children, but their spouses and grandchildren. And, you know, it just can be, you know, pretty complicated. I've had a few cases where, unfortunately, you know, pending divorce is happening and one of the spouses, you know, died during that. And then it turns into, you know, this whole probate issue. So it just, it can get pretty complex, um, you know, in that regard. What have you seen, Ryan, in some of your cases? Well, I think it, um, one of the main issues is, is this a, is this a first marriage? Um, and, you know, are the, are the adult children, is it mom and dad that have been married for, um, you know, again, 30, 40 years, uh, that can be, you know, it can be completely, um, you know, can take people by surprise and it can be a real emotional for everyone involved. And, you know, although the court and, and you know, doesn't have jurisdiction like a over a three year old um, that, you know, in terms of allocating uh, parental responsibilities, something certainly that is. Um, you know, a unique aspect that can really determine 
um, the climate for settlement and, and can be one of those emotional considerations. But if it's a second or third marriage, then, yeah, what you were saying, it, you know, adult children can really have um, an agenda and, and they might be pushing um, their parent to get divorced, especially as they approach, um, you know, uh, the you know older age. They might be concerned about various things. And, you know, if there wasn't a premarital agreement or there's not a marital agreement that is is involved. And of course, we've done several episodes um, on marital agreements and premarital agreements and, and how common they are with second and third marriages. But I think that that really can, um, you know, determine um, the role of adult children. Uh, again, then you talk about dating. Because if you go back to the earlier scenario of mom and dad are getting divorced and all of a sudden mom has a new boyfriend, um, that can really cause some emotional fallout uh, in, in a great divorce. So, um, Amy, what's been your experience or, or thoughts on uh, great divorces and dating? Um, so when I think about gray hair divorces and dating, you know, that can just be, bring up a lot of emotions, um, you know, for adult children. Um, and, you know, what we're looking for, if you're dating during, you know, the pendency of a divorce, you know, as a divorce attorney, we're looking at dissipation, you know, is that um, spouse spending, you know, a lot of money, not for a marital purpose, you know, on that new, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend. So it just can complicate things. Um, and as you and I both, you know, have discussed before, when you're looking at a long-term marriage, we usually do see with the division of assets, it's going to be pretty equal. You know, yes, Colorado is an equitable state, but in most circumstances, um, it is going to be e equitable to divide the marital assets equally. Um, so I think, you know, those are, you know, some of the things that it just can complicate it. Um, and you don't think about, again, that, um, you know, it can complicate it emotionally, even with your soon to be ex spouse, when you're trying to negotiate with them, if one person has a new, you know, 20 year old girlfriend, um, you know, that can kind of exacerbate the conflict and litigation. Yeah. Amy, I think that to, uh, a little wrinkle on your a statement about division of assets in terms of disproportionate allocation. Again, if you're talking about a second marriage, and this has been, you know, only a, 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 a five or, um, you know, so short-term marriage, and you're talking about a 70-year-old couple, that is going to be a different scenario considerably Correct. compared to that 70-year-old couple, and they've been married for uh, 40 uh, years. So obviously it, it depends. And I think at least what I've seen is, you know, you could have um, a dead marriage. Um, you know, the people, they might not have been intimate for, you know, five, 10 years, a very long time. And then all of a sudden, you know, a, a new boyfriend or girlfriend comes in and, you know, the, the person's really excited. They've got, they feel like they have a new lease on life and they're buying all different kinds of presents and, you know, not just the emotional, like, well, you know, uh, Jim never bought me a diamond ring, um, you know, during our marriage. Um, but also you've got the financial aspects of, right, what is the traditional spend rate? And, you know, that is pretty well established. And if you have a significant deviation, you can have, you know, economic fault. But it kind of brings in the um, economic fault versus, you know, uh, 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 the fault that might not be a consideration by the judge in dividing assets, but that we certainly have to take into consideration. But I think, again, we're talking about planning. The final issue is estate planning and that, you know, we uh, oftentimes will see people, um, you know, as part of their estate planning, they might look at a marital agreement, premarital agreement, if it's a second marriage and they're later in life. But how can estate planning matter in a, in a gray divorce, Amy? Well, you know, when you're, I think it just goes to when you're thinking about creative solutions, like you could set up, you know, in a case, you know, a life estate for wife to live in a certain house, um, and then it goes to the children upon her death. So I think that, you know, we can use some of those estate planning tools to reach um, creative and equitable, you know, outcomes for people, you know, later in life. Um, so when I think about estate planning, it's that, but it's also like the life, you know, the healthcare directives, you know, we're talking about health, 
you know, people are going to want to change, you know, if you're not wanting your soon to be ex-wife or spouse or um, husband, you know, making medical decisions for you, if you're incapacitated, you know, you need to update those, you know, directives, um, you know, including your medical power of attorney, financial power of attorney, and also um, your living will, you know, so those are some of the things that I look at and deal with, you know, when I'm, when I have these types of cases. Yeah, and I think to clarify or to make clear, when you are going through a divorce uh, and there's a, you know, there's obviously a, a possibility, I mean, we can all die. Um, but, you know, when you're dealing with a great divorce, you know, I think it, it, it's morbid, but um, it, it it is more likely that someone, um, you know, can pass away. And so do you update that will? Do you update that living, um, you know, the the living will? Uh, because if you become incapacitated during the divorce, you don't want your estranged, you know, spouse. Although you may have been with them for 30 years, and and at the time you signed your living will, you don't want them to be signing off on you know various things and um, pulling the plug on you. But then also that relates to after a divorce is finished, you know, under Colorado law, the the, the there's this automatic. Um, you know, a change in estate planning um, when it comes to beneficiaries, but the the parties they might want to um, be unified and address it in their separation agreement in the divorce about how they're going to provide for estate planning if there are children. Um, and they might be unified on that um, aspect, and they they're going to redo their estate planning after the divorce, and they might want to have a provision in their separation agreement that make sure that they're unified um, on, you know, what, what happens to those assets and that, you know, when you've got adult children versus younger children, you're kind of getting into some complex, you know, estate planning, which, you know, we'll have uh, separate episodes with estate planners, but Amy, you know, what are your thoughts on um, those issues? No, I definitely agree. I think that, you know, if you can put in the agreement that you're unified on, estate planning that can help because as a divorce attorney, like two things I'm really thinking about when I'm dealing with gray hair divorces or capacity issues, if there are capacity issues to make sure there's an equitable division. And when there's adult children, I do also want to make sure that there is, you know, an equitable division if that's warranted. Like for, we're talking more in the traditional scenario of long-term marriage. Um, you know, because I'm those are factors, you know, that I'm thinking about. Um, it's not just my client, it's you know, their adult children, um, estate planning issues. You know, if you're in, on the same page with those, then you avoid conflicts, you know, down the road. Well, we'll have more episodes and to um, address the various issues estate planning, um, taxes, uh, retirement accounts, those sorts of, of issues that frequently come up. Uh, with uh, great divorces. But uh, until next time, thank you for joining us. And we hope uh, that you enjoyed our discussion on gray divorce.